Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining class. Uh, I hope you had a good learning experience in the first two hours and uh, you're ready to get into Romans chapter 7. You know, Romans is quite a, a you know, a, a heavy book, something that we need to really uh, think and understand what Paul is writing because um, he comes from a very scholarly view in this uh, scholarly perspective uh, in this book but it's uh, an interesting learning experience for us because so many doctrines um, we get more clarity on uh, uh, you know we are able to understand the truths that apply to our own life and uh, that can help us to uh, continue running our race um, you know, knowing these truths and also knowing these truths to teach uh, others, okay? So today we'll be looking at Romans chapter 7. Before we look at to Romans chapter 7, can one of you please lead us in prayer? Anyone? Anyone can lead us in prayer, please? Siddhant, would you like to lead us in prayer? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, Lord, we come before you. Lord, we surrender our everything to you. Let the word of your grace, which is able to build us, talk to us. Lord. We surrender everything to your hand. We surrender to your church. Let your Holy Spirit help us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Siddhant. Okay. thought somebody had their hand up. Okay, today we'll be looking at uh, Romans chapter 7. Uh, in chapter 6, Paul has uh, already established the fact that we have been justified freely by grace, by the grace of God. We have been made righteous in God's sight. We have a standing in grace. And then, you know, he talks about how we can live a life victorious over sin. Okay, and also in chapter uh, six Paul uh, presents to us uh, the truth of identification that through our identification with Christ or in Christ uh, in his death in his uh, resurrection in his uh, sorry in his in his crucifixion his death his uh, burial his resurrection in his ascension and him being seated at the right hand you know it uh, also uh, you know, we identify with him and we identify with him in the sense that through his death, the old man in us, in us, the old nature, the whole sinful nature has been crucified and the power of sin over our lives has been broken. Uh, and hence he says that we no longer have a sinful nature in our inner person. Uh, you know, we no longer have a sinful nature in our inner person that is exerting its influence from the inside out. And then he also, you know, talks about, he's talking about the spiritual reality, which he refers to as the positional truth that we have in Christ. And then he goes on towards the end of uh, the middle of chapter six and to the end, he talks about how he gives us practical actions that we have to take in order to walk experientially in this super uh, spiritual reality that we have in Christ or you know the practical act actions that we need to take um, uh, to live this positional truth that we have in Christ now in Romans chapter 7 you know um, uh, it's a, a challenging chapter actually for those who study the word of God who study the Bible uh, students of the Bible uh, especially when they're studying Romans chapter 7, it's quite a challenging chapter because, uh, you know, Paul refers to himself as I in several places in this chapter. So when we are reading this chapter, you will notice that there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I's that is mentioned, which Paul is referring to himself. And it's not clear whether he's talking about himself before he was saved or 
after he was saved. So all of these things that he's talking in chapter 7, where he's using uh, the word I, so referring to himself, you know, people are confused. People who study the Bible, people who are students of the Bible, they're confused whether Paul is talking about himself before he was saved or whether he's talking about himself after he was uh, saved. Uh, so it's not clear, you know, whether he was talking about himself as being saved and struggling in the flesh or, you know, uh, uh, people are even confused. Where was Paul in his spiritual journey uh, as he refers to himself in Romans 7? So this is a big question mark uh, that is in the mind of many of them who study the Word of God, especially Romans chapter Seven. Now, when we read uh, different Christian books, uh, the authors would explain things from their own perspective uh, based on a presumption or of a certain position that they hold on to. So some say that Paul is talking about himself as a new believer and he's struggling with uh, the sin. He's struggling with sin in his flesh or the weakness in his flesh. Or some people say that Paul is talking about the life of every believer on this earth. Uh, so that could be another position that people could take. Uh, what they are trying to say is that if you are a believer, for the rest of your life, you are going to be struggling with sin. Okay. So, you know, people who are writing on, on Romans chapter 7, you know, they either say that Paul is talking about himself as a new believer, when he became a new believer, and he's struggling with uh, issue of sin or you know is basically talking uh, uh, about the life of every believer on this earth because you know and they say that you know all of us as believers for the rest of the life of our life are going to be struggling with sin that is what they come to a conclusion when you know they read this and when they write about this but i would like to share uh, my viewpoint or our viewpoint you know, uh, and I'm not forcing uh, the viewpoint on you. We're not forcing our viewpoint on you or forcing my idea or my point of view on you. Uh, I'm convinced uh, from Romans chapter 7. And uh, even as we read it, you will look for it yourself and you can make your own decision. But I'm convinced that Paul is talking of himself when he was an unsaved person. Okay, when he was an unsaved person, when he was under the law. And he's talking of his struggles as a good man, you know, still unsaved, living under the law. Uh, but when we move to Romans 8, he's talking about salvation and the life in Christ. So for my stand, my point of view is that, you know, I'm convinced from Romans chapter 7, um, you know, that Paul is talking of himself when he was an unsaved person who is under the law uh, and he's talking of the struggles he was having uh, as a good man you know even when he was under the law he was unsaved he was he says he's a good man uh, still un unsaved and living under the law so in my understanding you know uh, as we read Romans chapter 7 yes say Sorry, Pastor. I was going to let you finish. I was just raising my hand to indicate that uh, I, 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 as you were talking, mm -hmm. I, I think I, I support your point uh, because it, it, it's a very huge contrast of life. The moment you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you to direct your life. Whereas under the law, as a Pharisee, everything was done in the flesh to please God. Whereas within him, he was having that struggle, you know, to do that which pleases the flesh. So I, 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 I kind of support your point, Ma. I, I've never actually really, really seen it that direction, but I do support your point. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you, Say. So in my understanding, you know, even as we read Romans 7, uh, whatever is being said does not apply to a believer. Okay. Uh, I'll repeat that again. My understanding as we read Romans chapter 7, whatever is being said does not apply to a believer. It applies to somebody. And in this case, we're talking about Paul, uh, who was not yet saved yet, but he was a good man who was living under the law. And it's showing the struggle of any person who's trying to live right, but does not have the life of God in him or does not have the power of the Holy Spirit in him, just like say he said, 
just now. Okay, so this is how we understand Romans seven, and I wanted us to be aware that you know different Bible teachers will see things differently. Uh, while it's quite clear for me that Paul is referring to himself in Romans 7 while he's under the law, some people may say it is a struggle of every believer throughout their lives, but I don't think that is right because Paul has already told us in Romans chapter 6 that the power of sin is broken over our lives and sin will have no dominion over our lives once we are in Christ. So Romans 7 cannot be an experience of a believer for the rest of their lives. They cannot have sin dominate their lives because Paul already says that, you know, in Romans chapter 6 that we are dead to sin. Why are we dead to sin? Because we're alive in uh, Christ. You know, a dead person cannot sin. And we've already seen that. I've already explained. So I don't think that's right because he's already told us in Romans chapter 6 that the power of sin is broken. Sin will have no more dominion over us. So in Romans 7, you know, cannot be an experience of a believer for the rest of their life. Sin cannot dominate their lives. But it's of a person. It's talking basically of a person who's under the law and not under the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's a good man, it's a good person, it's a good woman, you know, so has a good heart and who wants to do good. Okay. Yes, Christopher. Uh, yes, uh, Pastor. I, I just uh, wanted to clarify uh, or ask you for this clarification. When you said uh, uh, Paul, uh, before he was became a believer, that is the time when he actually. Uh, uh, I mean, Jesus spoke to him, right, on the on the on the way to uh, Damascus. Yeah, Damascus, yeah. yeah. An encounter with uh, with Jesus, he spoke to him on the right. Road. Yes, but 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 before that, I thought he was he was you know he was persecuting persecuting uh, Christians and you know uh, he was uh, uh, so I don't know I'm not sure uh, you know how well he was placed uh, uh, you know. Uh, I guess being a being a good man. Uh, I guess that that, that I just want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second point I, I I just wanted to just mention to you is, um, or again seek the clarification is that, um, as I as I sort of understand, um, we are we are we, you know, as a believer we 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 live in we live a, a life with with some absolute truths. An absolute, uh, you know, um, and these are right in front of us, and you know, we, 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 we have to accept it. But uh, I think there is, uh, there are, uh, you know, just levels of believers, um, uh, and uh, you know how they sort of, you know, use those abs absolute truths. So, for example, in 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 verse in chapter in six, where you know. We, we we become new men. Uh, I mean, become become a new man. Um, how many of us um, as believers really you know demonstrate that, and uh, you know uh, sometimes you know fall uh, because we we sort of you know go back to our our old man. So I I guess I I just wanted to you know make a point where you know. There is there are absolute truths which we believe in, and but yet we we are we, you know we are we are we are weak, yeah, mm -hmm. and we fall sometimes, yeah. True. Yeah, good um, uh, points. Uh, the first thing is you know how can we say he's a good man? Uh, Paul, in his own eyes, he would see himself as a good man because he was a zealous Jew. Okay. Uh, he was not looking at, uh, you know, uh, he was trying to do away with uh, the so-called Jesus, uh, what we would say, Jesus freaks, <laughs> or, you know, so-called uh, those who are spreading uh, the uh, about Jesus Christ, because he thought that was totally against uh, Judaism. And he was a zealous Jew, and he was doing what a zealous Jew would do. So in his eyes, yes, he was a good man. Um, but then, of course, you know, he, he realizes that uh, later. But here he's talking about, uh, you know, that uh, he's a good man in the sense that, you know, he was a zealous Jew studying the scriptures, uh, you know, uh, rooming other things that were coming in the way of the Jews, fighting for uh, the Jewish race, for uh, the laws, for the commands, the Old Testament Torah. 
uh, very zealous in that sense and also uh, somebody who's um, a, a, a well studied and knowledgeable about the old testament law okay so this is talking about when he was you know before uh, he he was in christ and yes the second thing what you mentioned is so true that you know we we see all of these truths here uh, but sometimes we are not mindful of the truths and i think um, uh, you know, it's the Spirit of God again that uh, brings about these truths, reiterates these truths, and hence it's so important for us to read God's Word, to meditate. Uh, the level of intimacy that we have, uh, you know, also not only brings in greater anointing, uh, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, uh, we see God using us mightily when, uh, you know, uh, when we come from that place of intimacy. So our uh, you know, our extension of our ministry is our intimacy with God. Uh, it's the power that we are receiving when we are intimate with God. And it's also meditating on God's word. The more we meditate on God's word, God's truth uh, is inscribed on our hearts and minds. And it's the Holy Spirit who would help us to, uh, you know, to live out these truths, to know these truths, to walk in these truths and to acknowledge these truths. And that is what was happening with the Old Testament, you know. Um, they had the laws, uh, but it was, it was something that they were doing as a ritual. And hence, God says, you know, I will give them a new heart. I will remove their heart of stone, give them a heart of flesh. I will write my laws, their heart and mind, my spirit will enable them and help them. It's the Spirit of God. And so it's important for us to have intimacy, not only with the Father, Son, but also the Holy Spirit, read God's word. And that's when these truths become a reality in our lives because uh, they are inscribed in our hearts and minds, cannot be taken away. It's the Holy Spirit who keeps reminding us. And we read in John chapter 16, the Holy Spirit will teach us and remind us everything that Jesus has said or has spoken. Yes, Mangi. I hope that helped, Christopher. Sorry. No, I, it, it definitely helps. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, as I said, I, I, I still subs kind of subscribe to the point that you know that there are there are levels of believers, and um, you know, uh, even you know, I mean, to quote a, uh, uh, something for the Bible also is that you know. Uh, when, when it mentions about you know all our righteous acts are like uh, like filthy rags, so that absolute uh, level of holiness is never going to be possible, uh, even with all the you know with all uh, ev with everything that God has provided to us on the earth. So um, there will be a time you know in, during the judgment where you know judgment day when there will be a time when you know we will have to uh, account for those. So. Uh, I still think I still think that there are, there are levels of believers, and uh, you know some are are, are able to do it more, some some are doing it less. Yes, there are le different levels of believers, Christopher. But uh, if you look at the parable of the seed, you know it's the condition of the heart. So we can't continue being in one heart condition. We have to have a we have to develop a heart condition where the soil is good. You know, uh, so it uh, like even Paul says here in Romans chapter six, you know, we have to walk. You know, he says we have to walk. It's a choice that we have made. If you listen to my lecture that I, 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 I said in the last class, it says, you know, it's a choice of our will. We have to choose. We have to walk. God has done all this for us. But that's why Paul is writing and saying you have to walk in, uh, you know, in, in what God has asked you to do. You know, you have to position yourself. So in the Bible also, the positioning is very important. When you position yourself the right time, the right place, uh, the right season, you know, you receive God's blessing. Yeah. So we can't make it as an excuse that we are, yeah, we all are in different levels, but we can't keep being at the same level. We need to, uh, to grow uh, in our heart conditions. That's when we receive the truths. Yeah, but yes, the people are in different uh, levels. We acknowledge that. Yes, Mangi, you have your hand up. Thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, uh, touch, you touched on uh, the question I want to ask about uh, different level of, of Christian. But we see the church in, uh, in Corinth, although they had uh, the truth, 
uh, they, they knew they believed Christ, they were still, uh, con they continued sinning. And yeah, so I just want you to clarify that a little bit, so if it can help us. How they received Christ and they continue to, uh, to sin. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Yes, Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says that, you know, uh, all of you are, you know, as believers, you are just flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. You know, when you come, uh, one of you has a word of prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Uh, you know, you, uh, you are just receiving from God. You are just mightily flowing in all the gifts, all of you, uh, and you're there to, you know, give it. But he's, he's talking about order. How to bring about order you know when somebody is prophesying listen to them uh, wait for your turn uh, um, and then he also says yes you are uh, flowing in all of these things but you are still infants babes in christ uh, you know can't give you solid uh, food is still drinking milk so so he's actually uh, you know writing to them and he's uh, encouraging them uh, or uh, motivating them to see their spiritual position and stand that it's not just flowing in the spiritual gifts that talks about your spiritual maturity but he's saying that you need to come to the understandings of the, the truths of the doctrines in God's word and you have to live out those truths those truths have to be evident in the way that you live in the way that you uh, you know you behave you have to have the kingdom culture the kingdom thinking the kingdom uh, lifestyle so he says in in all of these spiritual aspects yes you are all are uh, you know flowing mightily in the gifts but still you are babes in christ you can't give you solid food you're still drinking milk and he says it's time for you to move on uh, to learn about the spiritual truths to grow in the things of god did that help mangi yes but thank you okay okay so we'll uh, move on uh, so romans chapter 7 uh, so you can read and you can, uh, you know, uh, you can see for yourself, or you can take a stand, uh, you know, uh, who Paul is, uh, what he's he referring to himself, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, his life before he was saved or after he was saved. Uh, but, you know, it cannot be, um, uh, a, a, you know, a struggle of every believer throughout their lives because, you know, the power of sin is already broken in our lives. Okay. Yes, say. Yeah, yes, Pastor. I, I just wanted to make an observation that I, I think the early fathers who wanted to make the reading of scriptures easy for us by dividing it into chapters and verses, in a way, yes, it was good, but it has kind of sectionalized some things such that when we're reading some chapters, we forget that there is a flow to what each writer is doing. Because if we if we look at it as a letter, I don't think we'll be having this conversation of, you know, who was Paul talking about. We would actually get it. But the moment you just make it a chapter, you just zero down that chapter, there's always this tendency to isolate it from all the flow of the gist from chapter one itself, you know, and all that and the points that he's trying to make. So I just wanted to point that out that if we look at it from the beginning and keep going, then we would see where Paul is directing us and we'll easily get what you are saying. Thank you, Mom. Yeah, thank you, Say. That's a very good observation. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, yes, I think chapters is kind of, uh, you know, even breaking that trend of thought, the line of thought for us. That's why I go back to, you know, kind of reiterating what we have uh, learned, what truths Paul has already established before we continue into the next chapter. But since it's a letter and, you know, there should not be any problem because we can clearly see and understand. But yes, it's for some people who kind of get too deep into <laughs> studying God's word that they're so deep into it and sometimes they can lose their own, you know, logical sense of reasoning. And uh, so, you know, anyways, we, I, I just thought I'll mention this truth. I didn't want to confuse anybody. I didn't want to, because if you read somewhere else, you come across this and you'll have your own clarity and you can take your own stand. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we'll move on. So in chapter seven, you know, Paul is talking about the law, which he refers to as um, Old Testament law. And he also talks about the law in the context of sin. Okay. Which means the law of sin. He talks about the law and which is referring to in some places referring to the Old Testament law. And then he also uses a law in the context of sin. 
which is saying the law of sin, which means uh, the control or the dominion of sin that we have to deal with. So in this chapter 7, you know, Paul reveals that just as a believer is dead to sin, the believer is also dead to the law and is therefore free from the law. Uh, however, this does not mean that the law is sinful or it's evil in itself. You know, the law, uh, as I've already mentioned uh, previously, when we were talking about the law, I mentioned that the law is good, it served a purpose. Uh, the law, when it was brought about, it made people aware of sin. They knew, okay, what we're doing is sin because we're missing God's mark. We're going against him. Uh, we are breaking. Uh, we are doing something that is wrong. So the more uh, you know, we, they, we were made aware of sin. Uh, the more uh, Paul says we want to break it. And why do we break it? Because sin dwells in us. Sin is part of us. It's in my flesh. There is nothing. There is no good thing. And the law of sin is working in my flesh. And um, and he says the sin is a law that is now controlling my body and that is what he is talking in chapter uh, 7 but uh, you know uh, but he's basically saying that to a believer a believer's debt to sin is also debt to law and is therefore free from the law so the real problem actually is not the law but the sin that rules and dominates the flesh and the members of our body members of our body means the different parts of our body okay the mind the, the emotions uh, our attitudes, our reactions, and the law required people to do things in the strength of the flesh, uh, which was impossible uh, because sin already dominated the flesh. Okay, so sin was more noticeable by the law and only further exposed the weakness of the flesh because the more they tried to do it, they couldn't keep the law, the more they were sinning, the more they were breaking it, and so it exposed the weakness of the flesh and then Paul highlights the struggle we face in the flesh where sin has dominated for so long and uh, then you know he prepares us for the truth that is revealed in chapter 8 on how we can overcome the law of sin that works in our flesh by the Holy Spirit. So just briefly an overview of this chapter now let's study this chapter in detail uh, we'll read chap chapter 7 verses 1 to 6. So can somebody please read chapter 7 verses 1 to 6, please? Romans chapter 7, 1 to 6. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law had dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which had an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she gets married to another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to being, bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Thank you, Susan. So here Paul is specifically speaking to Jewish believers uh, because, you know, uh, he's talking about the law and it's only the Jewish believers who are familiar with the law, the law of Moses. Uh, you know, uh, it's not referring to the Gentiles because they do not have the law. And, uh, you know, why is he saying Jew? Uh, how do we know he's talking to Jewish believers? Because he calls them brethren. So hence, uh, you know, Jews, because he's talking, they have the law and, uh, uh, you know, they are believers because he refers to them as brethren. So he's specifically here writing or, uh, you know, communicating to Jewish believers. And he's talking about life before they were in Christ and life after, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, when they are in Christ. So life before and after they are in uh, Christ. And he's talking about how life um, uh, has changed or life was changed uh, once they are in Christ. So before uh, the Jewish brethren were under the law, but now he's impressing upon them or he is helping them understand that they are no longer under the law when once they are in Christ. Once they are in Christ, he says they are free from the law. So to help them to understand this, he's using an analogy of a wife. Okay, and he says a wife by law, she is bound to a husband. Okay, and if a husband dies, she's free to marry someone else because she's no longer you know uh, uh, bound to the law she's released from the law of her husband that's in verse uh, 2 but the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives but if the husband dies she's released from the law of her uh, husband okay so you know uh, he's saying brethren you know i want you to know uh, that you have been dead to the law through your identification with Christ or you know you being in Christ okay that is what he says in verse 4 therefore my brethren you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you have that you may be married to an other to him who was raised from the dead that is he's referring to married to another to him who was raised from the dead is to be married to Jesus Christ or to come into spiritual union with Jesus Christ that we should bear fruit to God. So here he's saying, you know, brethren, I want you to know that you've been dead to the law and how you've been dead to your law once you are identified with Christ in his uh, in his uh, crucifixion, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection, in his ascension and him being seated on the right hand of the Father. Okay, you identify with him uh, and you being in Christ, you are now dead to the law. So the shift has taken place, you know, uh, and he's saying that when we were outside the body of Christ or when we were not in Christ, uh, you know, um, uh, he's saying that we were under the law. But now since we are identified with Christ, we are in the body of Christ, uh, you know, uh, we are in Christ. So, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we are no longer under the law. So a shift has taken place, a shift from being outside the body of Christ and now being in the body of Christ. Christ. Now, when they were outside the body of Christ, you know, as like I just said there, you know, they are under the law. Uh, but now when they are in the body of Christ or they are in Christ, he uses the phrase, uh, you know, uh, you are married to another. Okay, which means that they are in Christ or in the body of Christ, uh, you know, they are married to another and they are now in Christ. And once they are in Christ now, the, they are dead to the law. So far, as so far for for a believer as far as a believer is concerned you know he is dead to the law okay it's over it's gone and now you know a believer is in the body of christ uh, they are married to christ that means married means they're spiritually united with christ they're one with christ they are in Christ. And then in verses 5 and 6, he says, when we were in the flesh, which means, uh, you know, when they were not believers, but living in the past sinful life, he says the sinful passions aroused by the law, which means the sinful passions were highlighted by the law or the law brought about or showed us our sinful passions. It means it was a law that said, do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery, um, do not covet. And if there was no law, you know, these passions would look like very normal. You know, the part and parcel of any, any human being, it would just be normal. They would think that everybody around them is doing it, uh, you know, so it's normal for them to do it as well. But when the law came, they knew what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. They knew what is right, what is wrong. Uh, even though everybody around them is also doing, they can't justify their actions by saying that everyone is doing so, I'm also doing. Um, but you know they had to see things in the light of the law and when they looked at the law the law said that all of these sinful passions were 
wrong. And what was the result of these sinful passions? These sinful passions, when it worked in them, in the members, in their body, you know, it only resulted in death. Okay. Death here means, uh, yes, you know, uh, uh, physical death, it also means uh, spiritual death, it also means eternal death, and it also means that, you know, death is, uh, uh, it also means that, you know, when we're living in sinful passions, it's corrupting our bodies, it's bringing about sickness, it's bringing about um, uh, depression, hopelessness, uh, so all of these. So he's saying these sinful passions, you know, work, in the members of our body, and the only result is death. And in verse 6 he says, but now we have been delivered from the law. So he's just finished saying that, you know, when we are under the law, we are without Christ, you know, we were living bound to sinful passions that were highlighted by the law, which means that was brought, you know, brought forth or brought to light by the law that what we're doing is wrong, what we are indulging is sinful passions. It's uh, not what God wants us to live by, it's not the standard of God. And he's saying, but now, you know, but now we have we have been delivered from the law. But now means when we are, you know, become believers, when we are we come into Christ, when we identify with Christ. He says, when we identify with Christ, you know, we have been delivered from the law. So, you know, and he's saying that, you know, uh, where are we now? We are, he's saying now all of us, I'm writing to the church at, the, uh, at Rome and all of you are believers. So all of you now are in the body of Christ. You are in Christ. You are, uh, you know, identified uh, with Christ. You are, uh, you know, in spiritually you are uh, united uh, with Christ. And he also says that you are... Uh, you know, you are in a positional truth. That means you have, you are in Christ, and you are spiritually united with Him, and that is where um, you are now. And He says, now since we are in Christ, you know, we are living in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That means we are living according to the uh, the newness of the Spirit. That means uh, the Holy Spirit that is helping us. Uh, to live according to God's standards and not the oldness of the letter. He's talking about the oldness of the letter. He's referring here to uh, the Old Testament um, law. So he's contrasting two lives here, the life under the letter uh, or the uh, life under the oldness of the letter, which is talking about the, the law, which is uh, referring to as the oldness of the letter. And the life that is in the newness of the spirit, he's saying the life under the uh, the life uh, in the spirit, which is, you know, a life that is uh, uh, spiritually united to Christ or married to Christ uh, uh, or spiritually united to in Christ or, you know, in Christ, which he refers to as the newness of the spirit. Okay, so the oldness of the letter uh, is people who are not believers, who are living under the law. Um, the newness of um, the spirit, he's talking about people who are living in the spirit, who are married to Christ, who are in spiritually united to Christ, who are in Christ. So the main point in these first six verses of uh, chapter 7, Paul is getting the Jewish believers to understand that, you know, we are not under the law anymore. We are free from the law because now we are in Christ, we are in the body of Christ, we are, um, uh, you know, married to Christ, we're spiritually united with Christ, and hence we are serving God in the newness of the uh, Spirit. Just as a cross reference, I would like us to see, uh, you know, Galatians chapter 5, verse 18, where Paul is uh, saying, you know, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, he says, if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why aren't you not under the law when you're led by the Spirit? It's because the Holy Spirit is going to help us to keep the law and much more than the law. Okay, um, you know, we already saw that uh, in the Old Testament law, you know, when you commit, uh, when you murder somebody, do the act of murdering, you know, uh, we saw that in grace and law. 
okay, when we studied in chapter six, uh, we saw, uh, you know, uh, the Old Testament law says if you commit the act of murder or commit the act of adultery, you have sinned. But Jesus takes, uh, you know, grace to a higher level, to a higher standard. He said, even if you hate your brother, you know, or you're angry with your brother, you, you know, you have uh, murdered your brother. It's equal to committing the act, you know, or if you even look lustfully at your, uh, at, at somebody else, you've already committed adultery in your heart, which is equal to sin. So, you know, um, uh, here he's, um, uh, he's telling us, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, when we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to help us to keep the law and much more than the law, much more than what, you know, God requires of us to live a holy uh, life. And he's saying, you know, the Holy Spirit in chapter 5, he goes on to say that the Holy Spirit helps us to bear the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he Paul writes against this, there is no law. Okay, against the fruit of the spirit, you know, all of the fruit of the spirit, the nine fruit of the spirit that I said, he he listed all out, and then he says, against this there is no law. So the which means the law cannot hold us against this. So when you walk in the spirit, you are not under the law, and hence you know Romans chapter seven verse six, you know we are in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter of the law. So he's telling the Jewish believers, you don't have to live under the law anymore. And then he goes on uh, in verses 7 to verse 12, where he talks about the law and the struggle with sin. Okay, so can somebody please read verse 7 to 12, please? Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 12. Anyone? Romans chapter 7, verse 7 to 12. What shall we say then? Read, read, Asha. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it, it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Thank you. So in this um, verses, you know, verses um, uh, 7 to 12, Paul is addressing the whole aspect of the law. He has just told the Jewish believers that, you know, we're not under the law, they are not under the law, and that they are free from the law, uh, that, uh, you know, they are in the body of Christ, they are married uh, to another, which means that they are uh, spiritually united in Christ and you know they are serving God in the newness of the spirit okay so he's just you know uh, established these truths in uh, verses 1 to 6 and in verse 7 he again you know uses the same familiar rhetorical question where he says you know what shall we say then is the law sin and you know uh, it's an implicit answer it's the answer is already there certainly uh, not okay so the problem is not with the law uh, as he concludes in verse 12 he says you know the law is holy uh, and the commandments are holy and just and good so there's no problem with the law uh, the problem is not with the law but the problem is because of the law sin became very powerful okay because of the law sin became very powerful which means Paul is saying, I knew that there was something called sin 
And then I realized that I couldn't, you know, I, I, I knew there was something called sin when, you know, I, when the law was there because the law showed me that I was doing something that is wrong, you know, then and that's when I realized that there's something called sin, that I was doing something that was wrong. And then I realized, and Paul is saying, I realized that I couldn't be free from this thing. I couldn't be free from sin. So the law actually highlighted my weakness against sin, which means the law uh, showed me that I was sinning. And also Paul is saying that I realized that, you know, I couldn't stop sinning. I couldn't be free from uh, this thing called uh, sin. And in this passage, you know, there's a very interesting uh, uh, point that Paul makes in verse 9. And Paul says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Okay, now this is a very challenging verse for many to understand. Uh, you know, Paul is referring to himself, but you know, when was Paul in the state? And how do we understand this, you know, uh, this verse correctly uh, to the best of our understanding? Of course, the best person to ask would have been Apostle Paul, but since, you know, he's not there, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit can help us. So actually here, before coming to know the law, you know, uh, uh, he was, Paul is saying that before he came to know the law, he was not under the law. Means he did not know what he had, uh, that he did not know what he had to submit to. Okay, he was just, you know, people who do not have the law, they do not know what is right and wrong. I mean, uh, only when the law is there, they can say, okay, for example, you know, there's a law in our land that, you know, uh, uh, or in our city that, um, uh, the person who's riding a two-wheeler has to wear a helmet and, uh, you know, now they're making it a rule that the person who sits behind also has to wear a helmet. Yes, Mangi? Thank you, Pastor. Um, yeah, based, based on that, uh, if we, 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 we go to an island and we preach the gospel and their people uh, live sinfully, and they are, they are not taught the, the, the gospel, uh, uh, laws. Can they continue doing what we're doing if no one has taught, taught them uh, uh, the, the Ten Commandments or uh, the law of God? Because we've, we've presented Christ to them and then we leave. They know Christ, but they don't have the, the scripture to, to tell them the law. So can they continue? Is it okay if they continue doing what? They do, or the Holy Spirit will guide them. Thank you, Pastor. Good. Yeah, thank you, Mangi. I think we need to uh, uh, always uh, interpret Scripture in the light of our Scripture. Uh, we've also seen in Romans, uh, you know, in chapter, uh, you know, I think it's chapter one or two. Paul is saying that you know uh, the Gentiles don't. The the Jews have the law; they will be judged by the law, but the Gentiles have you know, their conscience. And he also uh, talks about, uh, you know, how, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, creation, you know, reveals the invisible attributes of uh, God and uh, re reveals his, uh, the Godhead, the deity, and the, and the power of God. So people are without excuse. They can't say that they don't know God. It's their conscience. Uh, and they're also their conscience uh, tells them what is right and wrong. Uh, but when, yeah, when they come to uh, 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 accepting the truth and knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, yes, it's the Holy Spirit that uh, uh, will guide them, will teach them. And also it's the word of God uh, that, you know, that they have to read and will guide them and lead them. So for us also, uh, you know, there are so many things that uh, uh, we can be doing, but when we read God's word, God's word, uh, you know, uh, corrects us, rebukes us, admonishes us and trains us in righteousness and holiness. Okay, so uh, we also need God's word. We also need... Uh, you know, spiritual uh, impartation, uh, you know, we, we go to church, we hear sermons, and, um, you know, it's one way we are learning about how we need to live our lives, how we need to walk with God, um, and also reading God's word, and yes, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, reminds us about it, yes. Does that help, Mangi? 
I, yes, Pastor, uh, our conscience and yeah, in the Holy Spirit will. Yes, yeah. Will you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mangi. So just to finish this bit and then we can end class. So Paul is, you know, um, so this is a very challenging verse uh, for many to understand. But, you know, before coming to, to know the law, uh, you know, uh, Paul was not under the law, which means he did not know what he had to submit to. Uh, so he was without the law in that sense. But when he was with, uh, when he was without the law, uh, he, he did not have an understanding of the law. That means he did not uh, have an understanding of what is good or what is bad or what is right and what is wrong. Uh, he says that, you know, I was alive. Uh, and he says, you know, um, this is before the knowledge of the law. He was alive at that time, you know, uh, alive to things. But he says he did not have an understanding of the law. And because he did not have the understanding of the law, you know, he did not know what is good or bad or what is right and um, wrong. OK, um, now, you know, just like to uh, explain this by sharing something which is uh, uh, not definitive, but it is indicative. For example, you know, uh, at the age of 12, uh, you know, people come to an understanding of the commandments or uh, the laws, okay? Uh, of course, children from a very young age, they know what is right, they, they know what is wrong. But, you know, at the age of 12, they come to a place of accountability. They come to a place where they're able to see the big, bigger picture that there is a God and you know doing right or wrong is not just about obeying dad or mom or it's not just about you know uh, doing something that is right to get a reward to get a chocolate and if they do something wrong uh, they don't get a reward but they actually come to a place of understanding the commandment as having to do with God okay having to do with god and uh, you know we we can't just say what is an exact age but you know uh, mostly people say uh, the age varies but mostly you know uh, between the 12, age of 12 and 13 you know people come to a place of accountability they come to a place of understanding where they're able to see a bigger picture of you know doing things that are right or wrong uh, you know in the context of um, uh, 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 of god and so here you know paul uh, is saying that you know he's actually in verse 9 he's indicating the transition he says he was alive once without the law but paul is saying when he came to an understanding of the law uh, he was he knew he was accountable to the standard of the law and he says sin revived and i died which means that you know um uh, sin uh, there was sin there was no way uh, for him to overcome that sin a uh, sin took a hold of him and he says i died means you know again like you know he's he's mentioning that you know my body become uh, uh, was given into corruption um you know all of these evil desires took control of me uh you know and um, uh, you know uh, uh, sin uh, was causing uh, bringing about uh, 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 you know sickness and si bringing about uh, uh, depression and hopelessness so he's saying that sin revived and i died which means there was no way to overcome sin sin took a hold of him and uh, you know and uh, sin was gradually bringing about death in his body even before he could finally experience physical death or a person can experience uh, eternal uh, death so here he's you know actually talking about uh, a stage when he was you know he was uh, uh, under the law or he even before he could understand uh, the law what is good what is bad uh, what is right what is wrong he said you know he, this was before the knowledge of the law and he says you know when he was alive at that point without the law but when the law uh, when he came to an understanding of the law you know he knew he was accountable to the standard of the law and he says when he came to that sense of accountability to the law he says sin revived uh, uh, which means that sin overtook him uh, he could not in any ways overcome sin uh, sin took a hold of him and he says i died okay uh, we'll stop here uh, we'll continue with verses uh, eight following um, uh, the next on friday any questions anyone hands
Yes, uh, somebody has raised up their hand. Any questions? Okay, when we go through this. Okay. Yes, Louis. Uh, I'm a bit concerned um, in the context of uh, our study. What was Paul doing writing to the Jews when he was sent to the Gentiles? Uh, because this is a very technical um, presentation. It's like he's making a, a, a case for God's, um, for the new covenant to a Jewish nation. But technically, he was sent to the Gentiles because we read things like Ephesians and other, other core, that were his core, core, um, core areas. You find out that he was making um, arguments based on revelation, but now he's making a very technical um, argument like if you read in Hebrews. Um, so what was, it, it's a bit because I've, I feel like he's trying to justify his calling to the Jewish nation even though he was not sent there. And I'm not saying what he wrote was not good. It was, was, was good, but the context of it just, if you're not good, if you're not uh, astute in the word of God, it throws, it will throw a lot of believers off. So that maybe that's why we're having that back and forth as in what he meant here or what he didn't mean here. I don't know, just just an um, open thought for maybe good. you can highlight or for our consideration. Yes, a good observation, Louis. Thank you. Uh, if you uh, look at what we have been studying in, chapter, in the introduction and chapters 1 to chapter 6, we see that Paul is writing both to the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, he mentions both of them. He, as I just said, you know, chapter 1, chapter 2, he's talking about the, uh, the Jews have the law, the Gentiles have their conscience, and but, you know, uh, how they are going to be judged. Uh, uh, and so, you know, um, uh, so he's talking, writing to both the Jews and the Gentiles because the church at Rome comprises of both the Jews and the Gentiles. But here he's specifically talking about the law because, you know, the Jews were the ones who are, uh, you know, custodians of the law. They were upheld. Uh, uh, you know, upholding the uh, the cause of the law, they were holding on to the law. And uh, if you look at even uh, the other books that uh, he epistles, sorry, he writes he's, when he's writing to Timothy, First and Second Timothy, when he's writing to Titus, he also writes, um, you know, uh, specifically telling the Jews, you know, uh, 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 you know about he's talking about the. Uh, Jewish fables, Jewish Jewish mythologies, um, you know, circumcision rituals, uh, the laws of eating, uh, which they were bringing into the church, and they were making it mandatory for the Gentiles to follow that. And it was overwhelming the Gentile believers. They were confused whether they, once as believers, whether they have to keep it or not, and the Jews were imposing it. And so when he's talking in that context of um, of uh, you know people who are disturbing the church bringing in all of these things and causing wrong doctrines he's talking not about uh, you know false teachers who are outside the church but he's talking about false teachers inside the church and he's sp specifically referring to the jews who are bringing in jewish mythologies jewish fables all of these old testament stories which were not there they're bringing it and telling the gentiles and teaching it to the people and believers and you know, talking about how they need to follow the circumcision ritual and it was overburdening the believers. So Paul even writes to the churches at Ephesus uh, uh, when he's writing to Paul, uh, First Timothy and Second Timothy, uh, you know, Titus, um, and when he's writing to the church at Colossae. So even in this context, you know, uh, wherever the Jews were, they were holding on to the law. And so, you know, he's he's first dealt with sin that we are dead to sin we are no longer uh, you know sin does not reign in our bodies because of our identification in christ and then he goes on to talk uh, about the law which you know the gentiles don't have the law so he's basically talking to the the jews and of course is the the letter is going to be read to both the jews and gentiles because they comprise the the Roman Church comprises of Jews and Gentiles. So even when it's being read, the Jews are all, the Gentiles are also going to be aware. Yes, you know it's we are dead to the law. So what these Jews are asking us to keep these laws of food and rituals and circumcision. And doing this because the law requires this, the Old Testament Torah tells us this is not uh, is not needed. But uh, he's specifically mentioning uh, you know Jewish believers there because he's writing to them. They have the law and so he wants them to know that you know uh 
no, they get to the law. They they don't cannot hold on to the law because the law is it's not the law. It's the it's the law of uh, of the spirit which he brings about. He talks about the law of the spirit in chapter eight, which he's talking about the Holy Spirit who would uh, who would help them uh, to live free from sin. And he's saying the law cannot help you live free from sin because in chapter six also he talks about the law and grace, and he talks about how the law is you know just um, tells us what is right and wrong, but the law does not empower power us uh, to follow the law but he's saying in in chapter 6 that grace uh, you know uh, 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 not only keeps us free from sin but grace empowers us uh, to not walk in sin and hence here he's not uh, you know trying to um, uh, you know uh, say specifically uh, mention the position of uh, Jews as an upper kind of a race or talking high about their position but just trying to correct them so that there is no kind of uh, disorder or wrong teaching or uh, overburdening of the Gentiles to follow the law and they themselves not to overburden themselves because in Christ the law does not uh, you know um, uh, operate anymore we are dead to the law I hope I answered your question, uh, Louis. Uh, Ma, Ma I, will accept, I will accept your answer kindly. Because it's a very, <laughs> you know, I will accept your answer kindly. So let me allow you. No, no, you don't have to so accept it. Uh, you don't have to accept it, Louis. You can, uh, you, you can still differ with me and we can still discuss. That's not, uh, you don't have to accept it. No, 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 what I mean, what I mean is it, it can, it can be discussed from different angles, but for, 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 for the clarity you made from the beginning of the class, it's a standing um, consideration for me, ma. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so Louis. much, ma. Yeah. But yes, he is called to the Gentiles and he has always been um, ministering to the Gentiles. And here also we see him ministering to the Gentiles because he's making life easier for them by speaking to the Jews and telling them, you know, don't impose the law. The law is your debt to the law. Yes, thank you. Uh, that was a good um, uh, observation. Yes, Mangi, you had your hand up. Uh uh, just, just, just to add to, to uh, Brother Louis' comment, is that this letter is really is writing to the church, uh, to a church where where they are both it contains Jews, Jews and Gentiles. So he has to speak to both, not only one group of people. But to, to Gentiles, it just is straightforward, and to the Jews, he has to go back to the law so that they can understand what he's talking about. Yes. Yes. Specifically, this few verses in chapter seven, he's uh, uh, talking to the Jews, and then he he comes back to you know generally addressing everybody. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all so much for joining class. Anyone has any interesting comments, thoughts? It was quite engaging today, our class. Thank you. Anyone has anything to share? Um. Yeah, I've got one. Uh that many people say, uh, many preachers actually preach that the law is, is absolute is over, we don't have to keep it. However, from the class today, I came to understand that the Holy Spirit actually helps us to keep the law and we don't have to do it ourselves because if we try, we fail and then only by the Holy Spirit in us, he will guide us. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Uh, the uh, the other point, the Holy Spirit helping us keep the law is not out of compulsion. It's not out of, uh, oh, I have to do it. Otherwise, you know, I have to go and make. That's what the Old Testament people were doing. Oh, I have to keep the law. If I sin, I have to, you know, I have to go and make this sacrifice, that sacrifice, I'll, I'll receive the wrath of God. And even the sacrifices that they were making was, uh, you know, not according to what God wanted them to do. They were just offering any animals and any, any sacrifices. And that's why God says in Haggai and Malachi, you know, shut the door of the temple. He says in, in I think, Haggai or Malachi, he says, you know, your, uh, your uh, worship is like noise to my ears. And he says, you know, try offering these uh, animals to your uh, governor and would he take it? So you're bringing all sick animals, lay, uh, you know, injured animals animals to sacrifice and uh, so God was also seeing that you know the attitude of the people was uh, oh we just keep the law for the sake of keeping it and you know not out of love for God and so the Holy Spirit is again going to help us to keep the law not out of uh, 
not because we have to, because we have to, you know, secure our eternal life, uh, but doing it out of um, a love for God, doing it out of a right motive, a right intention. That is also another reason. Okay, thank you, Mangi. Uh, thank you all for joining class. Anyone has any other questions, comments? No? Okay, we'll end class. Thank you all. I'll see you on um, on Friday. Uh, please uh, read Romans chapter 7 and come so we can uh, get go through it. And, you know, if you have any questions, we can take it up. Okay, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Sadie.